Well, did you bring your Bibles with you this morning? We got a few minutes. Let's dive into uh, God's Word this morning. And let's open to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's start in verse 31. The title of the message this morning is Take No Thought. Take No Thought. I, I shared some of this at Fellowship Cafe on Tuesday night, and it just really spoke to me in such a manner that I knew that I needed to share this here at the church on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 33. Therefore, take no thought. Now Jesus is speaking, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things, things that we eat, things that we drink, things that we be clothed with, in other words, the necessities of life, will be what? Added unto you. In other words, you'll be taken care of. Notice he starts off by saying, take no thought. Take no thought. In, in the New King James, it says, don't worry. Other translation, don't be anxious. The actual word in the Greek, the Greek word is anxiety. The word is anxious, but it comes from anxiety. So it's saying anxiety. Now listen to this. <clears throat> God does not want you to be anxious or have anxiety. This word anxiety in the dictionary actually is an unpleasant state of inner turmoil, often accompanied by nervous behavior such as pacing back and forth. Anybody ever done that before? <laughs> Paced back and forth. Then he goes on to say, it is subjectively unpleasant feelings of dread over anticipated events. It's having dread over anticipated events, such as feeling of imminent death. Anxiety is not the same as fear, which is a response to a real or perceived immediate threat, whereas anxiety is the expectation of a future threat, of something that's going to happen in the future. Anxiety is a feeling of fear, worry, or uneasiness, usually generalized and unfocused as an overreaction to a situation that is only subjectively seen as menacing. It is often accompanied by muscular tension, restlessness, fatigue, and problems in concentration. Anxiety, when experienced regularly, the individual may suffer from an anxiety disorder. So did you hear what, it, what Jesus says? Don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety. And then he says anxiety is the expectation of a future threat. Unpleasant th feelings of dread over anticipated events. Events that haven't even happened yet. In other words, Jesus say, don't take the thought. Why? Because anxiety wants to set in and try to paint a picture of what could happen down the road. And Jesus says, you don't need to be thinking about what could happen. Instead, seek me and what all that stuff down the road will all take care of itself. That's what he's saying. When we are anticipating or expecting something to happen based upon something we've heard, seen, or felt, something that has come to us through the five physical senses, then we're not in faith. See, if, it's, if we begin to anticipate something, we have an expectation that something's going to happen based upon what we've heard or seen or felt, you know, something from the five physical senses and we begin to visualize something that hasn't happened yet, that's not faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, for we walk by faith and not by sight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, a very familiar scripture, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. So notice... While we look not at the things which are seen. Let me read that again from up here. <clears throat> I 
When we are anticipating or expecting something to happen based upon something we've heard, seen, or felt, something that has come to us through the five physical senses, we're not in faith. Apostle Paul says, while we look not at the things which are seen. Why? Because if I start looking at what I can see, I'm going to begin to visualize what could happen down the road. But he says instead, look at what we not see. So there's a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. The unbeliever, he looks at what he can't see through the eyes of what he can see, which is the circumstance or the situation that's in front of him. He begins to visualize what's going to happen from that. Whereas the believer looks at what he can't see, God's eternal word, and instead... She put it up there on your overhead. The unbeliever looks at what he can't see through the eyes of what he can see. The believer looks at what he can see through the eyes of what he can't see. See the difference? It's a flip, complete flip. The unbeliever is looking at what he can't see yet. Hasn't happened yet. He's looking at that through what he sees. In other words, what he sees is portraying what's going to happen. Just like the results we've heard, testimonies today. When they first happened, people begin to see the end result, which would be death, the person dying or whatever, through what they saw. But that's not a believer. That's not faith. Faith looks at what it can see through the eyes of what it can't see. In other words, faith says, God's word says that I'm healed with his stripes, that he sent his word and healed me. And therefore, it begins to see what it sees, even, no matter what the symptoms are, as being healed. See? Whereas the believer, what they can't see, that they believe in, is the worst. What the believer, what the believer can't see is the best. And that's what he believes. The unbeliever believes the worst by what he sees. The believer believes the best by what he sees. Both are coming from an unseen realm. One is led by fear, anxiety, worry, doubt. The other one's led by faith in God and his word. Can you see the difference, how this works? That's why Jesus is saying, don't take any thought. Why? Because it's dangerous if we carry that thought. Because the thought's going to lead to something. We can all admit that we can find ourselves without thinking about it, visualizing things that haven't happened yet. Amen? I mean, you know, things, we can begin to visualize things that haven't happened yet. Uh, seeing them in our mind as if it is what could happen, and we play that out in our mind, the whole thing, even though it has not happened yet at that moment. Something comes in the mail, a bill, the vehicle breaks down, somebody, uh, there's something said about somebody to you that they said about you, and you begin to visualize things, and you begin to play on that, and it heads in the wrong direction. Anytime a thought is heading in the wrong direction, where it's going to bring harm to somebody else, or ill feelings towards someone else, whether it's uh, something that begins to paint a picture of things getting worse instead of better, whether it be health or whatever, we're not to take that thought. We can't grab a hold of that thought and run with it because it's heading in the wrong direction. It's being influenced by the devil who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he does it through thoughts. That's why Jesus said, don't take thought what you're going to eat, drink, or wear. The necessities of life. Don't be concerned about them. Don't get anxiety over life's necessities. Because he wants us to trust him, that's why. Everything that comes to you funnels through your mind. It comes through the the five physical senses, and those senses stimulate images in your mind. Things that come to you, brings, they'll come through thoughts. It's, it's stimulated into images. <clears throat> Once it's stimulated, if we take the thought, in other words, if we continue on with that image, it will lead us to future expectation, whether good or bad. The one that generates 
And the ones that it generate anxiety, fear, dread, worry, care, Jesus is very specific in trying to teach us, don't fall for them. The devil wants you anxious. Why? Because it gives him permission to paint a picture in your mind of an anticipated dread, something bad happening. He wants you to feel muscular tension, restlessness, fatigue, problems in concentrating, and ultimately give you an anxiety disorder. That would bring him pleasure. But guess what? Not going to happen. Not to this bunch here today or those watching by internet. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. He'd love that, but it's not going to happen. Jesus has the cure for anxiety. Take no thought. Don't take the thought. What's he saying? Don't allow anxiousness to be entertained by your mind. Don't take the thought. A thought can be taken through images that imposes or transposes on the mind, kind of like our overhead projector that we have here. The image is in there first, and it's being projected onto the screen. Picture that being your mind, and what you see on the inside is that thought is now projected out in front of you so you can see it. And as those images begin to change, they can take you down the wrong path. It can be worry about something going on, a family member, whatever, or you heard someone sick and you begin to worry about it, you begin to fret about it, you begin to paint a picture of them getting worse or that they're going to die and fear comes and grips you and you begin to cry because you're going to lose them because you love them. Jesus, don't, don't feed that. Don't, don't take that thought. You don't have to take it. If it's something that's, not, that's, that's trying to contradict God's word, we don't have to take those thoughts and run with them. Matter of fact, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he says, casting down imaginations, images, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, Jesus said in Mark 16, they were reading verse 17, that these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and what's going to happen to them? They shall recover, right? They'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. These are all signs of the New Testament believer, of what he's supposed to be doing. Well, the enemy wants to cut that out or snuff that out so it doesn't happen. And so what's he do? He wants you to feed off of wrong thoughts. He wants you to take the thought that he plants in your mind or the image and begin to go with it. But we don't have to. We can cast it down. If it's exalting itself above God's word, we're to cast it down. Jesus said, don't take it. Refuse it. No, not going to have this. One of the best ways to get rid of wrong thinking is through reading God's Word. If you'll spend time every day reading God's Word, then God's Word will replace the wrong thinking that's in you. If you have an area in your heart that you know needs to be changed, and you don't know how to change it, and nothing else has worked, feed it God's Word. Because you're replacing the thought pattern that was there with God's Word, this life. And this life will push out the other. It'll get rid of the other thoughts. They'll completely be gone. Things that I used to think about when I was young, things that I shouldn't have been thinking about that were on my mind at that time, were completely pushed out of the way by feeding on God's Word every day. It changed who I was on the inside. We were talking about it this morning in the van, the Bible calls it the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's able to cut off the serpent's head when he attacks you, in your mind, in your body, or anywhere else. You can take that Word of God as your sword, and you cut his head off. How? By speaking it. Because when it comes out of your mouth, it's a double-edged sword that came out of Jesus' mouth in Revelation. You've got you to gotta say it. It's got to come out your mouth. That's why Brother Paul was mentioned this morning. We've got to confess over our offering. We've got to confess we have the favor of God. We've got to confess our bodies are healed. We've got to speak to them. Because Jesus said, you speak to the mountain. And whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall 
have them in Mark 11:24. It's a, it's a different concept on living a Christian life, but it brings victory in our lives and it pleases our Heavenly Father. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 7. Notice what he says. Now this is Peter speaking now. Casting all your cares upon him. Notice the him is capital H. Who's that referring to? Yeah. Cast your cares upon God. Why? Because he cares for you. What's interesting in this word casting, all your cares, I liken it to a fish pole in fishing. And when you, when you go fishing, you have to do a certain action with the fish pole once you've got your bait on there or a lure. And then you, you, you take that off your, usually it's hooked up on the, one of the little eyes. They call it an eye. It's a little ring on the fish pole. You take your bait and your lure off, whatever. And then you've got to do something with a fish pole. What do you have to do? You have to cast it. So the, on the bottom of that, hooked to that line is your care. That's what Jesus is trying to say. And so you just take your care and <laughs> bloop. But then... The devil wants you to reel it back in. Uh-uh. Snip. <laughs> you snip it off with this God's word, the sword of the Spirit. You cut it off before you can reel it back in. Huh? That's what we're supposed to do. In the natural, we want to reel it back in because we want to catch a fish. But God here, is, he's saying it's casting your care on him. And you don't take it back again. You snip the line. It's God's. Gone. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to take the thought. Nope. Not picking it up. In my, uh, I want to go real quick to my, let me get to this scripture here in my Bible. I've got a, a note here in this. In my word wealth, it says care. It's the word mar, marmina, or, and it means to, uh, from miro, to divide to divide the mind, distractions, anxieties, burdens, worries, to be anxious beforehand about the daily things of life. Do you hear that? Distractions, anxieties, burdens, worries, concerns, cares. All of them. Whew. Throw them on the cross. Give them the God. Snip the line. Let it go. Don't take the thought. Don't let the devil paint an image of what's going to happen in your life. Oh, you got an ache in your, you got an ache in your body. Ooh, it's arthritis setting in. No, you don't have to have it. I don't take the thought. Sorry, not a part of my body. Mm -mm. Not going to happen. Snip. Gone. Maybe we should all get little scissors here for Easter Sunday or something, huh? <laughs> we can. Everybody carries a little pair of clip-on scissors with them so that every time a thought comes, you just take them out and go, snip. <laughs> what was that? My thought. It's gone. <laughs> Not mine anymore. I gave it to the Lord. Amen? Amen? This word also in 1 Peter 5, 7 is also the word anxious. We're to cast any anxious thoughts onto the Lord. In other words, we're to give them to him and not pick them up or even entertain them. Because if we do, we're opening ourselves up for the devil to project his dreaded images before our mind as the bait to get us to believe that that's what will happen instead of trusting God. See? Peter encourages us to trust God instead and to be aware of the devil's methods. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's go back to uh, verse 8 and 9 on that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary... Who's your adversary? Who? The devil. He walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is interesting. This caught me the other day, this word devour. And I was thinking about it. A serpent 
What do they do to pray? Hence what? They what? They devour. Hidden in this scripture is, gives you the picture of the serpent. They devour. The serpent comes up on its prey and completely consumes it. Don't let God, the devil, come along and completely consume you because he will. He'll consume your health. He'll consume your finances. He'll consume your vision. Hmm? Your plans for the future that are godly plans. He'll try to come and consume them and devour them so that you don't have a vision anymore because your body feels so bad that how can I ever fulfill what God's calling me to do now? I'm not going to be able to do it. I guess that's the end of that. I guess it's for someone else. Take no thought. Snip, snip, snip. Gone. That's not the way it is. And then say what God says about you and reinforce that. Look what he says then. What are we supposed to do in verse 9? Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. Everybody else in the world, it's a believer, is going through the same things. Anxieties, burdens. Listen, that's what he's talking about in this chapter. In 5, he's talking about the anxieties, the burdens, all the things that are going on. Your brethren, everybody's going through the same battles, but it's how you react in the battle. Listen to this. <clears throat> You're not going to win today's battles by being caught up in tomorrow's troubles. Do you hear that? You're not going to win. You can't win today's battles if you're caught up in tomorrow's troubles. Won't happen. You know why? Because faith isn't in tomorrow. Faith is in today. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice it starts out in the verse by saying, now faith is. Is means it's in present tense. Faith is in the present tense. Faith is always in present tense. That's why Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Jesus is always present with us through the Spirit of God because we're in the present tense. We live in this moment. God wants us to learn how to live in the moment, not live in tomorrow or next week or next year because that's what's going to... Our faith isn't out there. The only thing that's out there is what the devil wants to perceive to you, which is fear, anxiety, all these things to bring anxiety on you. Wants you all worried. Wants your blood pressure going up. Listen, we need to learn how to rest in God. Rest. Trust. Learn how to cast whew, all that anxiety and everything else right on him. Instead, cast it on the Lord. Snip. Cut the line. Let her go. It's over. I'm not going to have anxiety no more in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now faith is. Faith works for today. We just read from Peter. He said, whom resist steadfast in the faith. We're to resist the adversary, the devil. How? By being steadfast in faith. We resist the devil by being steadfast in faith. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself, therefore, to God Resist the devil, and he will flee. That's how you get rid of the wrong thinking. That's how you get rid of those thoughts that want to paint the wrong pictures. Submit yourself to God. What do I got to do to that? Steadfast in faith. Faith in what? Faith in God's word and God's ability that he will do what he said he'll do, which is what he's promised in his word. So if he said he'll heal you, then if you'll trust that he'll do it, he'll do it. Instead of the picture of the enemy painting you that you're going to die 30 years before your time. Doesn't have to be that way. Could happen. We all want to go to heaven. Glorious thing if someone goes to heaven. Praise the Lord. We can't be sad over it, but at the same time, 
You want to know whether you've finished your work on this earth or not for God. Because if you haven't, stick around. You don't have to go. Don't take the thought. Snip. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, this is how this stuff works. Amen? Faith only works in the present realm. The devil wants to get you out of this present realm and dwelling on what could be by portraying to you future events. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. I'm not ignorant of, of his way of his methods and plans. Stay focused on today. Your faith will work as you deal with one thing at a time and give it to God. Just take one thing at a time during the day as it comes. Give it to God. If it's a thought you shouldn't take or entertain, don't entertain it. If it's something you, you, you struggle in, go find some scripture. Start reading the word of God until them thoughts are gone. Don't look at tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own, the Bible says. We don't need to be worrying about tomorrow. Just focus on today. Focus on right now. Your faith works right now. Right now, faith is. And tomorrow, guess who's already going to be there waiting for you? God. If you'll stay on today, your focus on today, and your relationship with God today, he'll already be over there in tomorrow working on it. So that when tomorrow comes, it won't be the way it could have been. See? It won't be the way the devil would have painted a picture for you to have seen it to have been. It's going to come out the way God wanted it to be because you stayed in today and you trusted him and you cast your care on him. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father, that it's not your will that any of us have anxiety. So if you're here this morning and anxiety is something you've had to deal with, worrying, caring, all this stuff, I want you to just slip your hand up real quick. Just slip your hand up. If you've been someone who, you've dealt with a lot of anxiousness and worry. Okay, there's a lot of folks in here. So, <clears throat> let's just say this all together. Father in heaven, Father in heaven I, ask I ask you to forgive me for taking the thoughts, for, taking the thoughts. for allowing, for allowing. Let's see, I want to word this. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for taking the cares, taking this anxiety, all these things, all these images that the devil put before me. I take this care now, and I cast it on you. Snip. Gone. Thank you, Lord, for taking my cares. Help me from now on not to take wrong thoughts. I will cast them down in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for delivering me today from anxiety. Amen.